Okay, hello DJ. Hello, how are you? I'm great, and to all our listeners and viewers, uh, welcome to the Filipino Freethinkers podcast. That's also a video. This is another conversation for a cause, and this time it's with DJ Grothy, the president of the James Randi Educational Foundation. So, hello. Such a pleasure to be on the show, Red. Uh, glad to join forces with the great work your organization's doing, and has been doing for quite some time. Thank you. So, we'll, we'll be talking a lot about labels today. Uh, one of the first few that you took up in your advocacy of skepticism and, and free thought was the free thinker. Um, you right. were, you formed the Washington University League Free Thinkers or Wolf. Can you tell us a bit of the background on that story? Yeah, a couple uh, points there. Uh, I didn't solely form it. Instead, I was involved with the organization early on, along with other students at the uh, at the university there. So right out of Bible College, Red, I uh, interned with uh, the Center for Inquiry or the Council for Secular Humanism that summer. And while I was at uh, graduate school, that internship happened and I was involved in this campus free thought group at school. And it, and, uh, it was called WOLF, Wash You League of Freethinkers. And the great thing about that, uh, the tagline was be a wolf, not a sheep, right? So the Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, the, the local evangelical Christian outreach organization, they love that tagline. And in fact, we uh, worked together on some things. You know, we, uh, we cared about the same questions, even if we didn't have the same answers. I remember one professor once asking me, you know, why do you even need a group like this? This is Washington University, almost uh, incredulous that, that free thinkers would need to organize. Uh, but it just goes to show you that many of the educated elite actually aren't very aware of how well organized the cultural competition of the Enlightenment is even at the leading universities. So free thinkers, like you, you mentioned that you wanted to work together, like you didn't have to necessarily have the same answers. So was this a conscious choice to use the word free thinkers instead of something else, say skeptic or atheist? Well, I remember my friend at the time, Jason, uh, his name was Jason Jones. He's not really plugged in this organized movement uh, anymore uh, that I know of. But uh, I think free thinkers was a broad uh, category, uh, and it didn't draw lines in the sand. It didn't say, oh, you're an agnostic, not an atheist, you don't plug in here, or you're a skeptic, but, but you're not a nullifidian or a humanist or a secular humanist, you're only a religious humanist. And that also meshed very well, I, and I'm mind reading a bit, I'm not sure this was exactly his thinking, but it meshed well with the national organization at the time, it was called Campus Free Thought Alliance, which was a campus outreach project of the Council for Secular Humanism. Now, years later, I joined the Center for Inquiry, eventually uh, uh, serving as vice president and director of outreach programs there. And while I was at CFI, we changed Campus Free Thought Alliance into something called CFI on campus uh, to even further uh, broaden the reach and not just be for non-believers in religion, but also uh, with a, a science education focus and a focus on what's called scientific skepticism. Maybe we'll yammer about that a bit more uh, as it regards uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation's limited focus. So uh, Freethinker was a broad uh, sort of a casting of a wide net and uh, it's a venerable uh, tradition, free thought, you look at the history of American religion, history of religion around the world, there are always people who call themselves free thinkers. And it doesn't mean they're doctrinaire atheists of this stripe or the other. Uh, it just means they set themselves as opposed to uh, traditional religion and superstition. Uh, you're right about that. Uh, my reading on free thinking like, led me to sources that showed that some of the early free thinkers were, in fact, religious. Like, uh, there was even some discrimination against atheists back then because they, be, before Darwin, of course. But anyway, right. uh, well, ju just on that point, one of the uh, great American free thinkers, Robert Greene Ingersoll, uh, he spoke at Lilydale as a free thinker. Lilydale, the late 19th century, upstate New York in the Burned Over District, the home of spiritualism. So, this new religion at the time that had as a core belief talking to dead people, like TV psychics do now. Uh, John Edward, James Von Prague, the late Sylvia Brown, people who say they talk to your deceased loved ones. Pardon me a moment. Uh, 
I brought our dogs into work today and they're wrestling. Um, so <laughs> our, our two little puppies. So uh, if you hear that, it's not because I'm such a menacing boss that the staff of the JREF are uh, huffing and puffing in the background. And that's my little puppy. So um, Lilydale, they weren't atheists. They weren't skeptics like we would consider ourselves scientific skeptics today. Indeed, they talked to dead people. They believed in seances. Nonetheless, Lilydale was considered part of the free thought movement of the day. Why? Because it promised a sort of scientific exploration of religion. They rejected old ancient books and they were looking at this, at the time, fringe science, we'd call it pseudoscience now, this fringe science belief that science might uncover what happens to us when we die. So you're absolutely right. Free thought does not mean some doctrinaire atheism. It just means a skepticism of received wisdom, of received religion, and a, a sort of um, intellectual opposition to mainline or traditional uh, churches. So, Superstition, yeah. So you got into the whole skeptical movement partly through your magic, your practice of magic. And of course, Randy is one of the, the most amazing magicians ever and also the one the most amazing one of the most amazing skeptics ever so tell us about the jref and m the intersection of magic with skepticism like how many magicians do you have on staff right well that's a great question uh it is true that my background in skepticism predates in a sense my background in organized atheism because as a teenager at 14 years old i joined a church, I became very religion, in fact, some re very religious, in fact, some sociologists of religion would consider the church I joined to be a cult, the Worldwide Church of God. At the same time, I got into magic, eventually becoming a professional magician. And it was through my interest in magic that I uh, came to become skeptical of psychics and the paranormal. I remember as a teenage seeker of all things spiritual, before I joined this church, I would go to like the St. Louis Alchemist shop. It was a, a quasi new age shop, but they sold witchcraft stuff and for spells. And so I explored that. And then I got into magic and the magic inculcated a sort of baseline skepticism of the paranormal. Note that it did not make me an atheist at the time. I still joined a church and was active in that uh, fellowship for many years. So there's an intersection of magic and skepticism. I don't think necessarily uh, uh, between magic and atheism. It wasn't till years later when I got a good li little liberal arts education at the Bible College affiliated with that church that I became a skeptic of religion, then grad school, um, became an ardent atheist, I'm reminded of Dieter Rose's line, there's nothing like a good Jesuit education to make you an atheist. Well, I got a liberal arts education, became a religious skeptic. Uh, you talk about Randy's role in skepticism. That's where I first learned of Randy. I didn't think of him as um, a big uh, paragon of skeptics, a, a leader, a sort of a spiritual leader of the skeptics movement. He is that. I knew of him as a magician first. I remember reading old magic magazines as a teenager, and his name would pop up everywhere. And you get this sort of cultural literacy of magic by reading those old magic magazines. He is a leading figure in that world. Years later, I realized, my gosh, he's had, you know, many careers. He's sort of a renaissance man. Uh, if he wasn't doing magic, he'd be doing something else amazing. Uh, and magic wasn't enough for this uh, interesting, this great man. He retired magic at 60 full-time. He retired from doing it full-time and started doing skepticism full-time. And indeed, this year marks the 25th anniversary of him doing skepticism full-time, uh, fighting the fakers, going around debunking. He doesn't like that word. We can explore why. Uh, exposing frauds, using his background in magic and his uh, expertise as a critical thinker. That's great. So, uh, happy 25th. I'll... I'll, I'll Greet you with that. that. Yeah, I'll mention that tomorrow. And so you joined the Center for Inquiry. You found this. Yeah. I, I kind of remember you finding the Free Inquiry magazine somewhere, and you would oh, eventually, right, right. you would eventually edit that. So tell us about your work at the Center for Inquiry, and and kind of use that as a jumping point to to contrast the kind of work that you did back there with the work that you do at the JREF now. 
Sure, and one point of uh, uh, clarification. I don't edit Free Inquiry. I'm an associate editor of Skeptical Inquiry magazine, but you're right. I've written for Free Inquiry for many years. used to have a, a little column uh, when I was at the Center for Inquiry. That story is, is just great. It, it, makes, uh, it makes the evangelical Christians who are very suspicious of sending their kids off to university, it sort of makes them right because I was at <laughs> Bible college, and I remember taking a class uh, – only at a Bible college would this happen. A psychology class, the textbook for which was on worldviews. And it was called Understanding the Times, written by David Noble and, uh, and a co-author. Or maybe just David Noble, that book. David Noble is this uh, worldview leader, really. Uh, he's co-author with Tim LaHaye of uh, The Left Behind. No, no, sorry, of... Uh, uh, um, Mind Siege, Left Behind, you'll remember Tim LaHaye's book, Apocalyptic Fiction, What Happens at the End of the Age When Jesus Comes Back, Skin Melts Off Faces, all of that stuff. Well, this book, Understanding the Times, imagine the ambition here. It explained the four religious worldviews extant on the planet today. So... It stuffed every belief system into four categories. Those four categories were biblical Christianity, Marxism, the New Age, and secular humanism. Now, uh, it took some fancy dancing to make sense out of the manifold ways people believe and fit them into these four categories. Nonetheless, that's what the book was about, exploring these four worldviews. And the more in Bible college I read about this one worldview called secular humanism, doggone it, it sort of seemed persuasive to me. That book mentioned a magazine called uh, Free Inquiry Magazine, and I went to the Bible college library and looked to see if they had it, sort of a, a, in a know-thy-enemy basis, and I started reading it, and it sort of converted me <laughs> to secular humanism. I remember having a debate, it was at Georgetown or UCLA, or I've done a number of debates with David Noble in the years since about religious worldviews in college, uh, campus, uh, sort of the role of religion in, in uh, universities. And I always take great pleasure in thanking him for being my first ever introduction to secular humanism. Um, so once I became a secular humanist, to use the language of religion, sort of converted, maybe deconverted is the right way to say it. Uh, I went off to graduate school at, at Washington University. We touched on that, interned with the Center for Inquiry, and later jumped aboard uh, that organization. First with Council for Secular Humanism, and that organization was going through a lot of organizational changes at the time, uh, merging or coming together with PSYCOP and uh, the Council for Secular Humanism, Center for Inquiry, all of that. And I was there for 10 or 11 years, had a, just a great time. That's one of the great organizations for rationalism around the world. So, hey, now come here. <laughs> come here. So, I actually have two dogs in the room as well. So, I uh, understand. You're, you're better at training them. Our one dog here is a rescue, and uh, he needs some manners lessons. <laughs> So the story that you just told, it really highlights how a lot of people, they, they would have become secular humanists or free thinkers or skeptics if they had had a chance to, to be exposed to these ideas. Because a lot of people, right. they, they don't even know what a free thinker is or what a secular humanist is until very late, uh, until they're old and their <laughs> beliefs are already entrenched. So it's really right. important, the work that you do at the campus level to spread I, these I, ideas. I think that's the real point, Red. At no other time in a person's life are these questions so easy to ask and so easy to get into. When you're living your workaday world, you have to, you know, get up early, get your kids off to school, pay your rent, all that stuff. You don't have a whole lot of time to sit and wring your hands and wonder about these big worldview questions. At the universities, you could do that. That's why I love this idea of campus outreach. What Center for Inquiry does, Secular Student Alliance is another outfit that does such a great job on the campuses. Uh, we used to do a number of events. Uh, I did some events. Ouija, come here, baby. Um, we did, uh, his name's Ouija, not <laughs> Luigi. Yeah, like, not, uh, not like the video game, but, uh, the, Ouija but like board. the Ouija board. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
we used to do events on campuses called Faith in College, which explored why students believed what they believed. And it was great to have a panel discussion and have a Southern Baptist sit next to a Catholic, sit ne next to a Buddhist on stage, sit, ne sit next to an atheist or secular humanist, and have everyone talk about why they believe what they believe in front of an audience. That's what a university is all about, free, unfettered, critical inquiry into these areas. You don't really get that at the workplace, you're nine to five. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I think our worldwide movement needs to prize that a bit more. And if you look at the success of our cultural competitors, outfits like Campus Crusade for Christ, they have an or annual operating budget approaching $400 million, right? Wow. Ours is infinitely smaller. Uh, of course, they say we have natural allies in the universities, and maybe they're right. <laughs> so it's important. Movements like these, organizations like the ones that you have worked with, they're very important because otherwise the the religious, the, the very organized religious groups will just run with it, and no one will really right. be there to to serve as a counterpoint. So, if eventually you became part of the James Randi Educational Foundation, and skepticism right. is what you promote mostly, uh, can you tell right. us a, about skepticism, just for the benefit of those who aren't as familiar with the idea? I am in my fifth year as uh, president of the James Rand Educational Foundation, and the mission of the JREF is to uh, provide reliable information about pseudoscience and the paranormal to the public, also to the media, uh, to various publics. Uh, we've started outreach to parents and educators and other things. And skepticism uh, is, in a sense, continuous with free thought. It's not doctrinaire. It doesn't say you must not believe in these things in order to be one of us. Instead, it's a method of inquiry. It comes from the Greek word skeptikos. Skeptic comes from skeptikos, which does not mean to debunk. It does not mean to reject a nonsense belief. It merely means to find out or to inquire. And that's what the JREF's about, promoting skepticism uh, about uh, these sorts of fringe or overreaching claims regarding the pseudoscience uh, beliefs a lot of people hold, also the paranormal, uh, the supernatural. Uh, we have all sorts of people who support our work, so we're not an atheist organization in that sense. Uh, it just so happens most of us working here are atheists, but you know, most of the people in the United States might be Christian, doesn't mean that the U.S. is a Christian nation. Uh, our mission is not to push atheism. Our mission is to promote a method of inquiry that says test claims. It's this audacious be uh, belief or position that says you should only adopt views that have sufficient evidence. That's what the JREF is all about. Now, in our work, we're sort of unique because as a watchdog organization, we'd like to uh, focus on and expose folks who make irresponsible claims that harm others in society. That's why we're the organization that goes after psychics or faith healers. Really, uh, looking at Randy and what he has been doing for many decades, this is the James Randy Educational Foundation, after all. We seek to advance skepticism about harmful pseudoscientific or paranormal beliefs. And you mentioned magic before. Uh, a number of the folks connected with us have this background in magic and can bring that expertise to bear on the project. Banachek, Jamie Ian Swiss, Penn and Teller have been supportive, you know, the great skeptics, Penn and Teller, uh, uh, James Randi, of course, I have a background in magic. So there's this natural intersection. So a lot of the critics of skepticism, they, they charge you with being, with subscribing to scientism, you know, right. you, that you, you worship science in a way, like it, it has to adhere to, to the doctrine of science or the dogma of science before you believe it and you dismiss anything that falls outside that, that boundary. And I'll talk a bit about uh, Jaime Likauco tomorrow with, uh, with James because he, he has some experience with him. But anyway, can you, you've also written a book on the beauty of science uh, and you featured Herbert Hoffman there. Um, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but uh, yeah. yes. So tell us about, like, how do you respond to charges like this? So the scientism charge, uh, you know, sometimes I think it's, it should stick because I've bumped into some folks in these circles who love science 
more than scientists love science. Like they really think science is the only way to approach the world. And if you take that to an extreme, that is what they call scientism. But uh, the skepticism that James Rand Educational Foundation pushes, uh, we reject scientism insofar as it actually exists, and it's not as widespread as the charge would make it sound. Sometimes it's a straw man, sometimes people charge someone else as being scientistic, just as a way to dismiss their skepticism or their inquiry. But, you know, if, if someone says, uh, love doesn't exist because there aren't units of it that you can measure, or uh, you, you know, I, I, I knew a skeptic in St. Louis once who was against reading great fiction because it wasn't true, right? So that's a sort of thing, uh, you know, ain't nobody at the JREF that sort of skeptic. Uh, that might be more like a cynic, uh, a, a sourpuss who just bah humbugs the world, and those are few and far between. Uh, granted, you go to enough skeptics in the pub gatherings uh, around the world, around the United States, you might bump into one or two sourpuss curmudgeons, but that's not universal to, uh, by, by any means. I like that, that the, the way you perform your debunking, you don't really think of these things as science, I, I, in the sense that you go to the laboratory and you have these elaborate right. measuring devices. They're very practical. Anyone could think of them without even having a science background. And, I'm, and, of and course, I, yeah. I, I might even say it's, you know, our tests, our million dollar challenge. You were asking about the James Rand yes. Educational Foundation earlier. We do a lot of projects and programs, one of which is the million dollar paranormal challenge. And it's done in the spirit of science. It's not really how science works. Science doesn't work by offering a prize. Hey, uh, conduct that experiment and you get a million dollars, <laughs> right? That's not science. It, there's a certain publicity stunt nature to it. And that's fine because we're seeking to raise awareness uh, about these sorts of claims, both the responsibility of the public when evaluating them and also to put some of the claimants on notice, especially when the claims are so harmful. Uh, but the tests are done in the spirit of science. That means we work with a claimant to put together a protocol that can test uh, the claim uh, in a mutually agreed upon way and in ways that look at evidence, sort of empirically that is, as opposed to relying on faith, received wisdom, special knowledge, something like that. So it's done in the spirit of science, but you're right, we don't walk around in lab coats uh, and uh, uh, do that sort of stuff. Um, you know, one way of thinking about it is maybe pr uh, practical or applied methods of inquiry that uh, very broadly construed in sort of an enlightenment sense of science would be called the scientific project, but it's not science, uh, uh, you know, like at a lab at a university or something. So who have you challenged recently to take the to take the test and who, who have actually accepted and how, do they, how did that test go? Well, we, uh, we have three sorts of folks who plug into the Million Dollar Challenge. Uh, one, people can apply at randy.org and that's for anyone who believes they have a uh, testable, a demonstrable, a paranormal ability. Uh, that, that they can show us under mutually agreed upon terms. And we have 10, 15 applicants a month. These are people who fill out the application, send it in. And those get sort of stuffed through their pipes. We have a team that evaluates those claims and we, we uh, work out protocol and we test those. Um, we may only test a few of those claimants a year because frankly, a lot of people who apply, their applications are rejected. You know, rule number one is you have to fill out the application completely and if you don't do that, that's a good indication that, you know, you might not be approaching the million dollar challenge with the seriousness that we think it deserves. Uh, but also some applicants, uh, some claimants are rejected because they cannot formulate their paranormal claim in a way that can be tested. They w will say, you know, that they have an ability to... Uh, one applicant a couple years ago, maybe I shouldn't talk about it because he sued us, uh, but uh, he, his claim was that he had a UFO received uh, ability to read the, the true language behind any written language, but only he knew what that true language was. So it was beyond the ability to test, it, like even to formulate 
uh, anything before the fact. Now we we thought about well, could it be? Could we? Uh, uh, you know, was there some way to pre predict what uh, what the answers would be that we could test against? We, you know, we worked through all that, and we just couldn't come up with a protocol. Um, so the claim has to be testable. That's one category of uh, folks that we test with the million dollar challenge. People who apply, but the other are uh, it, it, the other category is uh, the the celebrity psychics, the celebrity paranormalists, people like James von Prague, Sylvia Brown, Psychic Sally. Uh, uh, do you do you guys get Teresa Caputo, the Long Island medium in we've, the Philippines? Stuff? We've heard of yeah. On, the, on social yeah, so media, th at least. things like that, and we issue uh, public challenges to these folks uh, because, unlike the first category, you know, some some people might actually believe they have an ability, fill out the application, want to be tested. We think, though, there are some public paranormalists, call them celebrity psychics, something. Uh, we think it's likely that they know that they don't really have an ability. We think they're using a complex set of psychological manipulations, oftenly, uh, often called cold reading. And so we challenge these folks and put them on the hot seat uh, to see if they can prove that their stuff is real. One example, you said, who have we challenged? James Von Prague is someone we did about a year ago. James Von Prague is one of these psychic mediums who says he can talk to your deceased loved ones. We issued him a million dollar challenge. We said, prove that you're talking to dead people. This is right around the time we did an hour-long episode of Primetime Nightline where uh, we tested a, a medium and a, someone who read palms and an astrologer and some other things for the million. So we challenged James Von Prague. He was also in a segment on that TV show, and he ignored our challenge. He said he could talk to dead people. He ignored us. He ignored national media when they asked him about it. So... He was having a spirit circle in Southern California. This is where a bunch of folks pay top dollar to spend a weekend with him. They've all recently lost loved ones. They pay him gobs of money to go have him tell them what their loved ones have as messages for them. So he's connecting with the other side, right? He said he couldn't talk uh, 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 or he wouldn't talk to us, but that he could talk to dead people. So we brought some dead people to him, or actually not dead people, but undead people. We had a sort of <laughs> zombie action uh, at his event, and that I'm happy to say the little video we did of that became sort of viral, and it was covered, it got some national media attention, and you can find that at James Randi Foundation. It's youtube.com slash James Randi Foundation, and you'll have a link to it uh, on, on this interview. Um, we do live challenges. So it's not just the celebrities and it's not just the applicants who send stuff in, but uh, sometimes when we find a claimant we think who is serious and sincere and not just showboating and, uh, uh, you know, and we're not uh, trying to put them on the hot seat to raise awareness, but in the genuine spirit of inquiry that the sort of skepticism we push is all about, we'll test them live. So at the amazing meeting the past few years, we've had live tests for the Million Dollar Challenge. Um, and uh, this last year uh, at the amazing meeting in Las Vegas, we tested an Algerian remote viewer. This is where a psychic uh, is said to be able to leave his or her bo body and go so to some other remote location, look around in spirit form and know about that remote location. It's remote viewing. And we went through a very exhaustive, detailed, uh, complicated protocol with Richard Saunders, who helped us out at, at the event from the Australian skeptics. Um, and uh, it was sort of spectacular. On stage, this man's interpreter uh, connected with the Algerian remote viewer. And uh, shucks, the, the Algerian mystic failed miserably. Uh, the good thing about the experiment was uh, we got to explore the protocol, why we did what we did, and none of the audience, you know, hundreds of people in the audience, it wasn't a way to boo hiss the claimant. Uh, it was very respectful and done in this open minded inquiry way that I was talking about. And it was really interesting to have the 
interpreter, who was a true believer, who believed in this Algerian mystic's claim, say on stage, wow, I really thought he was going to win. And he didn't win. So I guess now I have to rethink, maybe he doesn't have the ability. And that big aha moment was amazing. He was even wearing a, uh, an amazing meeting t-shirt. And he, you know, he thanked everybody for the fellow feeling at the event. Uh, that's what it's all about. Open-minded inquiry, not sitting back in an armchair and saying, ah, psychics aren't real. Anyone who believes in psychics is an idiot. Because then you don't engage and you don't explore and uh, uh, educate if you just bah humbug. I like what you just told me because it shows people that it's not just about protecting others from, from charlatans. It's also about the, the people themselves who, who believe these things that are irrational and could harm themselves and others. And you have compassion for them. I remember watching videos of James Randi and he never gloats. Whenever he debunks right. someone, he's just very calm about it. And what, the, what does it feel like? You've debunked hundreds of people. They have hopes and dreams and aspirations. Mm. And at the end of the day, I, I'm not saying that you, you're biased towards disproving them, but you know, when evidence shows that time and again they get debunked, you kind of know that they're going to fail. So what does it feel like uh, to be the, the kind of people to, to give the bad news to them? Mm. Well, two things. Uh, while it's true that there's a long track record of paranormal claimants not being able to, de to demonstrate their abilities, we really try to keep an open mind and we don't enter investigations believing in the non-existence of the claim. We're open-minded. Why is that? Because we would love if we would uncover some paranormal or occult ability that could be demonstrated and tested and replicated. Why? it would change science as we know it. Not only would we all be awarded Nobel Prizes, right? But it'd be a real advance of our knowledge. So we don't begin uh, re rejecting claims. We don't uh, begin with the conclusion that there's no such thing. And it takes a special stripe of person to be like that. It's much easier to say, there's no such thing as UFOs. There's no such thing as psychics. Instead though, we say, we haven't found evidence yet, but we're open-minded and we really want to find out. The other thing is that when a sincere claimant comes forward and wants to be tested, uh, uh, you say, you, I think you use the word compassionate or something along those lines, there's a real humanism in the sort of skepticism that Randy advances. Joe Nickel is another great example here where, uh, I mean, here in, in um, skepticism, not at the James Randi Educational Foundation, he's at PSYCOP, uh, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Uh, that humanistic skepticism says, save your ire for the charlatans, for the people who are lying to the unduly credulous. Save your ire for the people who take advantage of other people. But don't ridicule or make fun of the believer. Indeed, it's our educational mission to educate people, especially if they're a believer. Uh, so um, here's an example. The psychic mediums do tours in the United States. I don't know if they come to the Philippines, but uh, Sylvia Brown used to do a lot of these. Uh, James Von Prague still does. We equip local activist skeptics not to go crash the party, not to go heckle Sylvia Brown back in the day or James Von Prague, but to go with educational resources for people attending. Flyers, resources, has a little background on the methods we think these uh, performers use, and then uh, really relevant information about the psychology of belief and also about the stages of grief and how uh, uh, psychologists say are the best way to deal with the loss. Here's a hint. It's not going to a, a fake psychic pretending to talk to your dead relative. Uh, so that's part of our mission there, educating the public with reliable information, not poking fun at believers. So this compassion that you have, this open-mindedness and willingness to, to accommodate people, um, I, I imagine that you draw a lot of believers to, to your organization, you know, um, religious believers, not believers in, in the paranormal. And that, that's been an issue for yeah. some, I, I, I've heard. Yeah, uh, 
I, I wouldn't say a lot, but I, I'll tell you that only uh, three quarters of the folks who attend our annual meeting, um, T- Thomas, do I have that number right? Only like three quarters would identify as an atheist, right? Uh, the, uh, fully a quarter, maybe a third. I, for some reason, I'm not remembering the exact numbers. Um, but we do surveys of attendees every year, and we get sort of a breakdown of beliefs and their self-identification. Uh, there are believing Christians who are plugged into our work, uh, and we don't we don't say, "Oh, you're not allowed because you believe in one thing we don't believe in." Um, or we uh, we have folks of diverse political backgrounds, you know, Marxists and uh, people on the far left, social Democrats, people on the far right. We have, we have big statists, we have anti-statists and anarchists and libertarians. Um, you know, we have people across the social uh, movement spectrum, you know, gay people who really believe in gay rights and people who are against gay marriage. Uh, all of these diverse points of view are fine because what unites us is a commitment to looking at evidence, uh, especially when it comes to pseudoscientific and paranormal claims. That's the mission of our little organization. You're right that some folks have said, how uh, can you let someone believe in God and be in your circles, right? Uh, And if we were an atheist organization, it would be pretty silly for us to have believing Christians plugged into uh, our activities. But we're not an atheist organization. We're a science education organization set up in the public interest. Uh, we uh, have this mission to help people learn reliable information about pseudoscience, uh, pseudoscience and the paranormal. Now, it is true we're often working in common cause with national atheist organizations. We're good buddies organizationally with the Richard Dawkins Foundation, uh, American Atheist, other outfits have co-sponsored some of our events like TAM in Vegas. Uh, But uh, we think skepticism is best when it focuses on method, not on content, not having a statement of non-beliefs. So in that sense, sort of a non-doctrinaire skepticism and uh, we think that's the best way to advance our mission. Yeah, I really appreciate where you're coming from because that's the kind of organization that we're also running here. We have religious members and we have members from all sorts of um, political or socioeconomic backgrounds. And we, we agree. We come together not on skepticism, though, although a lot of us are skeptics, but mostly on secularism. So, right. so, so we certainly... Well, there, have, yeah. there, exactly. There are religious folks... Now, now, we really stay out of the church-state separation thing just because it's not our limited mission. You know, different organizations are set up to do different things. Personally, I'm very supportive of that. I know Randy is. Uh, But uh, if you cast a wide net and you have a mission that that you're focused on, you can get help and support. People can roll up their sleeves in common cause to advance that mission. Uh, If we were more interested in raising money uh, than we were in advancing this sometimes unpopular mission. Well, the thing to do these days is to push atheism. Atheism is like the most popular thing. That's how you're going to raise money uh, because people are so passionate about atheism, especially when they burn by re- when they've been burned by religion. Uh, at the Center for Inquiry that I was at for 10, 11 years, uh, you know, the major- the lion's share of the donor dollars came in from the atheists and the humanists and the skeptics never really got fired up. It's sort of harder to get fired up about Bigfoot or ghosts or critical thinking, etc. It's very easy to get fired up over the threat called uh, religion that's encroaching, uh, especially, uh, you know, if you're advancing the secular state, church state separation, that sort of stuff. Um, so strategically, it may be smarter to like push atheism, but we're not only thinking uh, the bottom line and strategy in that way. We're thinking really mostly about mission. That's that's what we have to focus on. How do we advance mission? How do we most effect- effectively promote critical thinking about pseudoscience and the paranormal? I remember you saying in an interview once that you know atheism is not enough. Like you prefer working with with people who broadly apply their skepticism, you know, not just confined to that one religious question. But 
are skeptical of other issues like social justice or human rights issues. So if you weren't, um, I mean, does a skeptic have a responsibility to go beyond just being skeptical and to sort of promote the skeptical attitude on other social issues? So uh, I would draw a distinction now between organizations that have limited missions. Yes, yes. Movements, which, you know, can be even broader than that and what one might do individually. Yes. So individually, I'm a, a gay rights activist, right? I work for equality, I'm a gay man, I'm in a, you know, about to start my 10th year in a relationship with my partner. Um, so personally, I, there are a lot of things I care about, right? Uh, and I believe my skepticism should be brought to bear widely uh, concerning all of those sorts of things. So I think skepticism has something to say when it comes to gay rights, especially regarding the pseudoscientific, the quack views of the far right that they often use to argue against gay rights. You know, the pseudoscientific belief that if uh, two gay men or gay parents uh, raise kids, the kids will be mentally aberrant or something. You know, that's just junk science. Um, or, or uh, you know, the, uh, some AIDS denialism, you know, skepticism has something to say about AIDS, which is a uh, issue relevant to the GLBT, the LGBT world. Still, that's not necessarily a, a big issue for this movement called scientific skepticism, which tends to do the heavy lifting on topics that generally science, uh, because it's so busy doing other stuff, generally ignores things like ghosts and UFOs and the parent, you know, uh, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, psychics, etc. cetera. Uh, I believe that skepticism is best broadly applied. I believe uh, that if you're skeptical of ghosts, it stands to reason you might be skeptical of the Holy Ghost as well. Uh, I, in that sense, personally am an equal opportunity skeptic. But that doesn't mean that I'm pushing a doctrinaire sort of skepticism that says, if you happen to believe in one of these 20 things I'm skeptical of, we can't work in common cause. I think that's hogwash. I think that's just a bad organizing strategy. So personally, I think broadly apply your skepticism. Organizationally, I think put on your blinders and... Uh, look at the uh, mission statement of the organization and let all the other stuff, you know, if someone out there disagrees on abortion and two skeptics and skeptics in the pub, one says, you know, we should uh, uh, argue that abortion is licit and the other says fetuses have personhood. Well, I say, you guys over your drink, you know, knock yourselves out, have that conversation. But that's not something uh, that the organizations of skepticism have to get bogged down in. Uh, because in that sense, they could, um, uh, you know, people of goodwill can disagree on some of those sorts of issues, um, and I don't want that to uh, remove our focus organizationally from the very unique mission we have to fulfill. You, you really have a lot to say about these social issues. I, I'm, uh, I follow you on social media, on Facebook in particular, and it's always interesting to hear what you have to say about these things. So you're also a fan of sci-fi, and one of the, the recent intersections of sci-fi and social justice and movements right. and all that is the movie Ender's Game, which recently came out here. All right, right. And I, I saw it. I loved it. Of course, I, I don't agree with, so any of the, with any of the, the political views of Orson Scott Card. But I love the book, right. and I love the movie. What's your take on it, like the boycott and all that? Uh, so as a gay rights activist, I think that, you know, God bless the gay rights activists. Sometimes they get it wrong. Uh, the, the boycotts. You know, there was a boycott of, what was Chick -fil -A? it? This pasta. Chick-fil-A. Chick -fil -A or b b was it Borali? What was that pasta, Thomas? Borali pasta? What? Bertoli pasta. Bertoli. Remember, there was a boycott of pasta because the CEO said some backward things about gay marriage or something. And there was this boycott of Ender's Game. I think, uh, and th you know, this just comes from my experience, you know, 15 years at this organizing thing. I think you pick your battles. Uh, you asked about Ender's Game. A boycott of the movie Ender's Game in no sense advances my view. 
advances equality for LGBT people, LGBTAQ people. You know, there's this category yes. of um, outsider sexualities, non-mainstream. So uh, Orson Scott Card is a devout Mormon, and he talks the talk, and he walks the walk. And I disagree with him. You know, he's on the board of uh, this anti-marriage organization. Uh, but boycotting the movie doesn't change his view. And punishing Orson Scott Card uh, is not going to happen by b having boycotted the movie. What that does is hurt you know, a lot of good folks who probably share my progressive values, other, others' progressive values, who, who worked on the movie. Orson Scott Card already got his money. He doesn't make more money from the uh, success of the movie. So uh, leaving aside the fact that the movie itself has a mes message that in a sense is like incredibly pro-gay. Why? Because it's all about empathizing with your competitor, uh, understanding the mind view, the perspective of your enemy. So if you think about that politically, it's about um, understanding your cultural competitors. And so Orson Scott Card's big cultural competitors are the gays, right? That's who he's really up in arms about. And it stands to reason because he's a devout Mormon. Okay, fine. Leaving that point aside, uh, I think the minute uh, uh, those of us who prize enlightenment values try to shut down repugnant views, views we don't share, like Orson Scott Card's, Card's views on gay marriage. Um, we cease being able to engage on them and persuade. Uh, they, those repugnant views sort of go um, underground and can fester. Uh, boycotting Orson Scott Card's uh, it's not really his movie, but the movie uh, based on his fantastic book. The first book I read, started reading at night and didn't finish until the next morning. It's such a good book. Um, it's sort of like refusing to listen to the great operas of Wagner because he had these reprehensible anti-Semitic views. That's my take. I much prefer fighting it out in, in uh, the public sphere. If yes. someone has a view that I disagree with, I don't want to, you know, uh, shut them up. I want to say, oh, really? Let's test those claims. Let's get into it. Let's argue. And maybe that's because I have this faith in human reason, but I believe if you engage, the best ideas rise to the top. DJ, it's been a pleasure speaking to you during this interview. There's a lot of other things that I want to ask you, but um, two final ones. When is the amazing meeting coming to the Philippines? And uh, when are you doing uh, an interview yeah. for For Good Reason next? So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, you heard it here, folks. I'm announcing uh, <laughs> Tam Philippines next year. Not really. Not wow. really. Yeah. So, uh, we would love for there to be uh, fostering of skeptics events all over the world. And indeed, it's been our pleasure to help support these. Um, and you guys put on a conference. We would love to promote it and help in any way that we can. Um, I'm not sure. I think Randy has been to the Philippines in some of his he skepticism has. work, especially uh, uh, exposing the, the psychic surgeons. He has a great story about that. You'll have to try to ask him. Um, so uh, we'd love to help out any way we can. Uh, you asked about four good reason. I did you know, two, oh, maybe 250, 200, wow. uh, over 200 episodes of Point of Inquiry, the old radio show and podcast I, I did. Uh, it should be said, I did almost no work for any of those. I just had an interesting half an hour conversation once a week. Uh, Thomas Donnelly, the fellow I've been yelling, you know, yelling <laughs> to a number of times during this uh, interview, uh, he did all the editing, all the real work. Um, and that was while I was at Center for Inquiry. Since we've been at uh, uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation, we started For Good Reason, which is a similar format show. It's an interview show. And I've done, how many, maybe 185, 90 of those. Uh, and we're on a short hiatus. That's because we're, we have a number of staff positions we're filling at the Randi Foundation right now. And, you know, it's sort of on the back burner. But maybe in the new year we'll uh, have uh, some new episodes for you. I appreciate the question. 
thank you so much and everyone please um, check out the links below to the videos that we've been talking about and the links to For Good Reason and uh, the archive of Point of, point of inquiry, inquiry as well. And thank you again, DJ, for being on the show. And I hope to, to see you at TAM next year. <laughs> oh, I hope you join us. Yeah, we, you know, we have a workshop every year on skepticism around the world. And we'd love to talk about the great work of uh, your group down, down in the Philippines. Down in the Philippines, Red. I look forward to it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And uh, yeah, talk to you next time. Bye.